Blood pressure is something that uh, every primary care doctor does, does plenty of, and what we're talking about specifically 75 and older, and recognize that there is aging changes that happen to our body. You know, you look in the mirror, you're not the same. You, every decade, you sort of look back and remember how good you had it 10 years ago. There's an increased thickness of the intima and the media, and this leads to an increased vascular stiffness. And so there's consequences of that. There, with a heavy salt load, those vessels aren't as compliant, and so they'll be a little stiffer, and you might result in some higher blood pressures than would be other times. But if they go out on a restaurant, kids come in to visit from out of town, and they're out to the restaurant uh, three, four times, you might see that the blood pressure is way, way up the week after and then comes back down uh, when they're eating their sort of regular meals. So there's changes in the physiology that's beyond just the structure of the vascular system. There are baroceptory changes and increased BP variability. So a medical student may bring a patient back and they measure the blood pressure within a minute, a couple minutes of, of being in that room and the blood pressure's up. You recheck it after they've been sitting waiting for you or you've been talking with them for 20 minutes and you recheck their blood pressure and it's down 20 points. That's a blood pressure variability that is common. You want to measure blood pressure when people are sitting at rest for five minutes. So impaired blood pressure homeostasis. Think about uh, the postural changes uh, that occur in a blunting of the baroreceptor reflexes uh, upon standing. It's not normal for them to have dizziness when they stand, but if they do, really look at your blood pressure medicine and think about it hard about deep prescribing. There's a patient that we'll see and their blood pressure is, is 170 or 160 systolic and they're saying, I'm concerned about my blood pressure and they're 90 years old and they've fallen and uh, in the past and they're not there for that that visit, but they're at a high fall risk. You sort of recognize them as frail and everyone wants to talk about the blood pressure being 160, 170. That's probably a, a patient that's better. Come back in a month and we recheck the blood pressure. We routinely are saying, come back in a week. Our, our model's a little different because the patients basically live where we are. But we're saying, let's not treat one blood pressure, your blood pressure today at 160. We know from uh, the research of the HIVET trial in JNC8 that it takes three years to see a statistical significance in, in blood pressure management. So there's not an immediate risk of a blood pressure being 160 or even 170 today or this week. But if I prescribe uh, an antihypertensive and they leads to uh, low blood pressure, that can have immediate consequences. A fall, fractures can be life-changing. I'm not saying don't undertreat with increasing age. They're at a greater risk of stroke. They're the ones we need to protect the most. And the same with the blood pressure. Treat their blood pressure. Don't be afraid to prescribe the medicine. But please always check it laying and standing. More of that later. Postprandial hypotension. Don't underestimate, underestimate this. They're having falls and they're happening after meals. What we do in our setting is we, we pull the records and we look at if there's three falls, we try to figure out what's the time of the day of the fall and if there's a something we can do and if it's frequently after a meal you know we're sort of thinking that maybe postprandial hypotension is the cause never underestimate the medications that can cause increased blood pressure so steroids being one uh, prednisone what an astute nurse practitioner i was working with and what she noticed was several of our patients were having syncope during physical therapy in our rehab section and um you know how things happen in medicine where you know, it happens more than once. You know, you see it two, three, maybe like four times, and you're like, man, it's like the same thing over and over. You know, you'll see four gout patients in a row, and then you won't see any for six months. Well, she, we were seeing syncope this one summer, uh, and it seemed like there was like three or four in a row, and they all had something in common. They were COPD patients, uh, asthma patients who were on a prednisone taper, and somewhere between day one and, and a week after getting off the steroids, they had syncopal events. Those patients were having higher blood pressures. They were being managed in the hospital for those higher blood pressure. They were discharged on extra medicine for their blood pressure. And then when the prednisone was over, the taper was gone. They no longer needed those increased blood pressure medicines. They were having fainting dizzy spells. NSAIDs is another one. Uh, excuse me. As I'm writing a prescription for an antihypertensive, I always ask, are you taking anything for pain? Anything new for pain for arthritis pain? No, no, no. Are you taking any ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Motrin? And so these are questions to ask and I make it a routine right before I prescribe an antihypertensive. Even patients I know that I've talked to and coached, Mirbegon, don't underestimate that as well. We were seeing uh, um, 20 or 30 percent of patients who take this medicine have an increased blood pressure. IV fluids, that's another one. Uh, at the hospital, they end up on some medicine. So avoid overtreatment of asymptomatic hypertension. There's consequences of aging, and it leads to some hypertensive urgency. Someone will come in. They're actually generally fine. They want their blood pressure checked. They find out it's 180. What could be non-pharmacologic strategies? Is there something that we can do different, that they can take an extra blood pressure medicine today, avoiding sending them to the hospital for this? So thinking about what is hypertensive urgency versus hypertensive emergency and what makes the difference. 
Okay, remember the hypertensive urgency is asymptomatic, and so that's the key. That's the one that they come in sort of routinely, and then you find it incidentally. There was actually a study of about 58,000 patients who were treated for asymptomatic hypertensive, really a hypertensive urgency, and some went to the emergency room and some were treated in an ambulatory outpatient. There was no difference in the cardiovascular events. These things can be treated with oral antihypertensives. You do not need IV medication for this. In a hypertensive emergency, the most common symptoms that you'll see is a chest pain, dyspnea, or neurological deficits. Remember, when you see hypertensive urgency in your office, it's totally different than when you see hypertensive urgency in a hospital setting. Remember, in your office, you're more likely, we're very comfortable as primary care doctors, prescribing these medicines orally, coming up with non-pharmacological strategies, thinking about the effects of anxiety and pain, you know, rechecking them in 30 minutes. In a different setting, that same patient who is in the hospital who has hypertensive urgency is getting an IV medication. And even though that guideline suggests that oral medication is just as good. An aggressive treatment of hypertensive urgency, asymptomatic, that does lead to adverse events. As, as many as one-third of patients in a hospital setting, 75 and older, who get IV medication for hypertensive urgency, they're asymptomatic, have an adverse event. Orthostatic blood pressure management, I mean, this is definitely a cornerstone. If I really want to find orthostatic hypertension, and I do, it leads to falls and fractures, and I believe it's preventable. It's in the Hippocratic Oath that says that prevention, let me, let me find that. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. Orthostatic blood pressure management, prevent falls by detecting orthostatic blood pressure problems before they occur. It's true. Some of my patients do fall, and then I find it, but there are a number of patients that I find it and they don't fall or they fall less often. Laying and standing is the best. But the most important thing is that you know that symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion is enough to make the diagnosis. And so when I was a medical student, you had to have your blood pressure drop systolic by 20 points or the diastolic by 10 points in order to have orthostatic hypotension. But that's not true. The definition includes symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion. So if anybody stands up and they say, oh, I'm a little woozy from that, especially going laying to standing, orthostatic hypotension. And remember the other chronic conditions that can contribute or cause it, and ultimately almost all of my patients, if not all, who have Parkinson's will will someday not need blood pressure medicine. And each visit that they have, I'm always wondering, is this the last day for them to have antihypertensives because it's so common for them to develop orthostatic hypotension. So we get gets us to J and C eight. You know, the experts told us that, you know, gold blood pressure for individuals greater than 60 is less than 150 over 90. Um, That's based on evidence the committee cannot make a recommendation for individuals 70 and older when they had chronic kidney disease. So that goal is 140 over 90 if they are less than 70. Anyone uh, greater than 60 uh, without kidney disease is less than 150 over 90 according to JNC8 published in 2014. Diabetics is less than 140 over 90. So we'll go back to our pre-session slide, our case. 80-year-old community-dwelling male presents to your outpatient clinic, JNC8, what would you do? 150 over 90. With diabetes, 140 over 90. So we're thinking about that IV fluid, and then we go right to this hypertensive urgency, hypertensive emergency, and we're thinking about those patients in the hospital and why so many have elevated blood pressures. All right, so uh, JNC8 continues to recommend ACE or ARB, never both, a diuretic or calcium channel blocker as the first line. So beta blocker is not first line in the management of blood pressure, according to JNC8. That brings us to Sprint. So Sprint threw a wrench into everything we, we were comfortable with. Uh, JNC8 based largely in, in studies called the HIVIT trial, which was published in 2007, 2008, uh, and then the Sprint trial, which excluded patients with diabetes or stroke. And so if you've had a, the Sprint trial was a pretty interesting trial. It was funded in part by the National Institute for Aging. They, we really wanted to better understand blood pressure goals for older adults, and they did a pretty good job finding criteria for it. Where They were planning a five-year study, and it was stopped early. It was better to be in the treatment group than the usual care group. They had planned for five years. It ran for just over three and the time to benefit, right? That's when that three years uh, for that blood pressure management, you can you get a benefit within three years. The primary composite outcome was myocardial infarction, other acute coronary syndromes and stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular outcomes. Now, I mentioned the exclusion criteria of anyone with symptomatic heart failure within six months, anyone with an EF less than 35%, a diagnosis of dementia or treatment for dementia with a MOCA less than 19. That was on our first slide. You know, why would they have this sprint trial, which we've all heard of, why would they include a MOCA? Well, they had geriatricians on, on the you know the board who designed it, again, funded in part by the National Institute for Aging. We come back to our 
pre-question session one. What do you do with this woman with recurrent TIAs who says she's independent? She's running her own bill. She gave up driving, but she writes her own checks. Blood pressure is a little high here. What do you do? And the answer is D, perform a Montreal cognitive assessment. I mean, it's, this is geriatrics where it is in the current day is this cognitive testing and, and it's a pretty hard test. It finds cognitive impairment, what you wouldn't know from a regular interview. So Sprint excluded these people and they were pretty smart to do that because when your MOCA is less than 19, like they use this exclusion criteria, a lot of those people or all of those people are making errors in their medicines. And so you're not really measuring the effect if there's no medicine oversight. So anybody who's got dementia on Donepezil or um, Mamantadine or has a MOCA less than 19, don't even consider lowering their blood pressure below the goal less than 150 over 90 according to Jane CA unless they have diabetes less than 140 over 90. So they published a study that showed that it was better to be in the treatment arm and the goal blood pressure in the treatment arm was to achieve a systolic blood pressure less than 120 millimeters of mercury. Well, well, the actual, the reality is that they did lower blood pressures, but they didn't get to 120. They got to 123 on average. And the, the amazing thing was that the, the serious adverse outcomes were similar in both groups. You really can't strongly say that there's more orthostatic hypotension in the one group than the other. The other thing to know is that they did not enroll people from nursing homes or assisted living. These were community dwelling people. So when we go back to their pre-session slide, you see that those are all community dwelling 80 year old who's coming in. What's their goal blood pressure in JNC8? You would still use JNC8 because you can't really apply sprint to anyone who's in assisted living or nursing home. They then took the, the sprint data and they looked at it just in those older than 75. They found that, again, looking at those p-values, that the primary outcome, which was a composite, was significant. And so was heart failure, all-cause mortality. So you had these outcomes that were significant, even in the adults greater than 75. The thing that I find the most fascinating is this slide here. Study was a 2015 published study. And then they looked at just those who were in the sprint who were 75 and older and they published that in JAMA 2016. And when you look at the numbers needed to treat, the overall study group was 61 and includes those who are 75 and older. All-cause mortality, overall study group, 90. You needed to treat 90 people to get one outcome. You needed to treat 61 in the overall group, but in the adults greater than 75, you needed to treat 27 or all-cause mortality, 41. So it's better to be in the treatment group and be older. We're, we're again coming to that theme where we're saying over-treatment, under-treatment. Well, with blood pressure, Pressure. It looks like the older you are, the more you want to be aggressive with the blood pressure. That's what Sprint tells us. You want to avoid orthostatic hypotension. And they routinely, you should know that, they Sprint group routinely measured you know, blood pressure standing. And if anybody's blood pressure drop was less than 110, their blood pressures were not further titrated. So if you're trying to use the data from Sprint to lower people's blood pressures, and I think you should, they're the ones who are going to benefit most from blood pressure control. It looks like that you should be routinely measuring their standing blood pressures. What can we learn from the sprint exclusion criteria? Well, that this doesn't apply to diabetic. No one with a prior history of stroke. No one with a MOCA less than 19. So if you're going to do the sprint, I hope you're all doing MOCAs. Systolic blood pressure less than 110 following one minute of standing. That is what sprint did. Routinely measure standing blood pressure. Target a blood pressure of 150 or 90 is okay. If the standing blood pressure is less than 110 at any time, raise the target from 140 back to 150. We're not recommending that you go from 150 target to 120, right? Sprint didn't even get to 120. They got to 123 on average. So go to 150, but go to 140 as a target. Once you get there, you might go to 130 as a target. I would not treat to a blood pressure target of 120 mainly because Sprint didn't get there. They got to 123. When we look at just those individuals over 75, the average age was 80. And I think they rolled up to 99. But So what do we do with 90-year-olds? We still don't know. It's likely that treating towards an aggressive target benefits people who are in 70s, uh, as we know from Sprint, who don't have diabetes, who don't have stroke, who have a MOCA greater than 19, and probably 80 one and probably 82 and 83, but there's going to be some age where aggressive blood pressure measurement does not help. And in fact, there is some age where it probably hurts. And you don't know what age that is. So you really want to know your patient. Who's the highest risk for falls? Who's uh, one fall away from being in a nursing home? One more hospital stay and they won't you know, be able to rehab out of it. Those are patients that I would really be cautious with. So hospital discharge, I mean, this is one of the my favorite things I've come across in the last year that uh, you know, when I got a chance to read something that was not COVID related. Intensifying antihypertensives, 
hospital discharge was that intensifying blood pressures at the time of discharge was potentially dangerous. And we talked about why that would be. You get IV fluid, you have blood pressure variability, your blood pressure goes up. You don't know. You feel fine. They're checking your blood pressure every four hours in the hospital. They find elevated blood pressure. They treat it with IV medication. Blood pressure comes down. You leave on new medicine. Well, this VA study, it was 90, 97% male. So we have to you know, really think about how do we apply it to our whole population since the majority of my patients are female. The mean age was 77 and admissions, uh, people were coming into the hospital for pneumonia, EI, or VTE. So the primary outcome was hospital readmission within 30 days, serious adverse events within 30 days, or a cardiovascular event. Now, we have to take this into account that this was a retrospective study, and they looked at data from 2011 to 2013, published in JAMA 2019. There was an increase in hospital readmission in 30 days, serious adverse events in 30 days, and cardiovascular events in the right-hand side, NNH, which is numbers needed to harm. You needed to intensify antihypertensives as compared to the medicines they were taking at home. In, in 27 patients, they needed to do that to get one negative outcome. And they had serious events, serious adverse events, 63 numbers needed to harm, and major cardiovascular events within 30 days, 72. So, so what's our recommendations from this study? Study, which is about, you know, it's a retrospective study, but I think we have to take into account our, our experience with this, have some proof here now that there's some harm when we intensify blood pressures at the hospital. Remember that a blood pressure of 150 over 90, according to JNC8, is a target for many, that's safe for many elderly patients. It's not acute. It's not going to cause harm if their blood pressure is over 150 at the hospital. They're acutely ill. This probably isn't the right time to manage their blood pressure if they came in for diverticulitis. All these studies are based on community-dwelling people, really not hospital people, right? And sitting blood pressures. Think about when blood pressures are measured in the hospital. They're laying, being called, I'm, this patient has a blood pressure of 180 systolic. What do you want me to do? I probably ordered IV medication at the time. This was uh, tw two decades ago. Not anymore. When I, when I can picture that patient is probably laying, getting IV fluid as we speak. Well, what's the sitting blood pressure? That's the blood pressure I really want to manage. That's the one I have evidence based. At the time of discharge, review the medication administration record. Look and see if the blood pressure was low at any time during a hospital stay. Resist that temptation to prescribe new antihypertensives at discharge. Routinely measure standing blood pressure in your patients. Always do this before starting a new antihypertensive, especially for elderly patients at risk of falling. Coordinate with the receiving primary care doctor. I hope the hospital is doing a good job telling us that we're starting a new blood pressure medicine. Please follow it. Don Fletcher, he turned 102. We filmed this last winter before COVID, and I had just that feeling that if I didn't film him now, I might miss my opportunity. And so found the time to swim some laps with him and that I would be able to share it with you. I didn't know it would be quite like this, but nevertheless, you see him. Actually, there's several you know, men and women who, who use the pool and swim, but he's a remarkable guy. Look him up. He published a book called My First Hundred Years, Life on Three Continents. He spent... Um, time with his father in Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Again, this is before World War II, right? Before World War II, his dad was a surgeon and a missionary, and uh, he, he also was a missionary in South America. Remarkable guy. The latest thing that he's done is is uh, is become an author, right? That's sort of new. So let me share this with you. And I, I would ask you what you're doing for your health and what you're saying to your patients for to encourage them to exercise. You know, I have uh, Don Fletcher, so I can just, you know, walk someone down to the pool and say, See what Don's doing? You see, you know his age and what are you doing? It's so important. And I think that if we see it, if, if you see it and you saw it today, if you can encourage your patients, they're really not old when they turn 80. You know, I was with a 93-year-old who said, I'd like to go back to 80 when I was in my prime. And that's always made me feel good as I, as I age myself. I think about, man, 80 is the prime. In many ways, I think this Don Fletcher, I think he's a remarkable guy. And, and he, maybe it took him all these years to finally get to a level where he had something to share with a book. He needed to live first. 